All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm Jen Shanger from the New Jersey Autism Center of Excellence, the NJACE, which is funded in part by the New Jersey Governor's Council and the New Jersey Department of Health. Um, I'm so happy to be here today with Dr. Sue Fletcher Watson, who is joining us from the UK, and she will be talking about developing a top quality evidence base for supporting autistic people and their families. Um, before I introduce her in full, um, I just wanted to remind everyone that uh, we do now offer certificates of attendance. So if you need one, um, we'll, we'll put the link um, in the chat before the end of the webinar. Um, you can also find those um, on our Facebook page and we'll link it with the YouTube link as well. Um, you will need to be logged into your YouTube account in order to comment or ask a question. We love hearing about you, so please tell us about yourself if you're open to it. Um, as, the, uh, as the presentation gets on and we get to the end, we'd also love to hear your thoughts on um, the type of research that would be important for you in the community. Um, and um, I just wanted to mention as well that we'll also have Spanish and English captions um, that will be updated and correct by the next, within the next two days. Um, so with that said, I would love to introduce Dr. Sue Fletcher, Sue Fletcher Watson, who is a professor of developmental psychology at the University of Edinburgh and director of the Salveston Mind Room Research Center. She is interested in how children grow and learn with a particular focus on development and neurodiversity. Her work draws on rigorous methods from psychology and applies these questions, applies these to questions with clinical, educational, and societal impact. She strives to achieve meaningful partnerships with community representatives and to support neurodivergent leadership and research. She is an advocate for open science and good citizenship in research and serves as co-director of research ethics for the College of Medicine and Veterinary Medicine. Welcome, Sue. Thank you for, so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Jen. It's a real delight to be here. I was very excited to be asked to come and talk on this subject. So I will just get started and bring up my slides. And they should be there now and someone will tell me if they're not, I'm sure. Um, so yeah, hi everyone, I'm Sue. Um, and I'm really excited to, to um, talk to you about what my thoughts are on what constitutes a kind of really um, a high quality evidence base for supports that might be useful to autistic people and their families. Um, before I get into the talk, I wanted to um, take a moment to plug a conference that I'm co-chairing in 2023, so just over a year from now, called ITACOM. It takes all kinds of minds. It's going to be taking place in Edinburgh at the Edinburgh International Conference Center, but it will be a hybrid event and it will be possible for digital delegates to join us and have access to the full program. And we're working really hard to make sure that online delegates have a similar experience. The conference is themed around neurodiversity and it's aiming to bring together a huge range of perspectives relevant to thinking about neurodiversity. Um, so, and that will include lots of neurodivergent lived experience, lots of research expertise, but lots of different kinds of practitioners as well from um, kind of education and clinical and other kinds of uh, professional backgrounds. So we're excited about the conference. And if you're interested in it too, you can go to itacom.org and you can sign up for updates and that will help you get the cheapest early bird rate tickets when they go on sale. So. That's my little bit of marketing, but I promise the rest of it is just research. Um, so what I'm going to do here is talk a little bit about, you know, what we might mean by the idea of top, top quality. And then I'm going to review three particular components of that, which I think are interesting and important to talk about. So I'll talk about some elements of clinical trial methodology that I think are um, elements that are particularly missing from some of the evidence base um, around support for autistic people. Um, I'll talk about co-production, partnership with members of the um, autism community and why we might be doing that and, and how we might be doing that. 
And I'll also bring in the concept of neurodiversity, which I think is a really important theoretical underpinning for our kind of support evidence base and think about how neurodiversity kind of uh, ties these things together. So um, what I mean by top quality in a nutshell is that any supports that we're offering to autistic people should be supported by a robust evidence base. So there should be no compromise on the quality of the evidence that's available. Um, and as I'll go on to, to talk about, one of the main reasons for that is, is so that we are making sure that we really consider the possibility of harm from anything that we are doing to support an autistic person, anything that uh, a, a therapist or a parent is bringing into that autistic individual's life in an effort to help them thrive, obviously we want to make sure that it's not inadvertently having the opposite of that desired effect. I also think that a high quality uh, 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 raft of supports should be meaningful and useful to the community. So you can have a beautiful high quality evidence base, but if you're not targeting something that is also important to autistic people, if your um, uh, mechanism isn't feasible for people to apply, so if you want to do something in schools but you haven't really taken into account the time and resources that teachers have, for example, um, and it needs to be accessible and inclusive across the kind of diversity of backgrounds that autistic people have. And I mean that in terms of diversity within the autism spectrum, but also diversity in the broader kind of societal sense. So accessible to people of all ethnicities or um, nationalities and genders and so on. And finally, I think as an important part of this, we should be committing to continuous improvement. So there's no sense in which the, the evidence base for autism support is finished. You know, we've done enough clinical trials now, we know what works and we can just keep doing that in perpetuity. Um, people's priorities change, our societal understanding of what autism is and, uh, and of, of the, the kind of appropriate ways to think about um, autistic flourishing has shifted dramatically in the last five to ten years and I'm certain will continue to shift in the future. Um, and also of course at an individual level people change over the course of their lives and they need different things at different stages in their lives and they have different priorities and different things are feasible as well. So any high quality uh, uh, selection of supports needs to be committed to a continuous improvement process to be legitimately high quality. Okay, so let's focus on that idea of a kind of robust evidence base first. So I'm not going to give you a kind of long lecture on kind of um, high quality clinical trial methodology. Um, but you know, I'd say some kind of key markers would be that um, the approach you're, re you're using has some kind of theoretical integrity. So there's a sort of logical um, and evidence based theoretical reason why intervening in this particular way or why offering this particular kind of support might lead to some sort of tangible benefit. Um, it should have been uh, trialed ideally in kind of well-designed, fully powered, randomized controlled trials by people independent of those who created the intervention. That's incredibly rare in autism research. Um, we just don't have the scale and the um, volume of, of funding support that that has been done very often. Those clinical trials and any other supporting evidence that's that's um, contributing to this particular approach should be reported fully and transparently. Um, diverse populations should have been involved in the gathering of the evidence base and in any kind of implementation work in terms of uh, translating that um, sort of uh, research activity into real world settings, clinics, homes, schools, etc. And of course, ideally, you would do all of that multiple times over and then merge it together in a systematic review to get a kind of robust uh, estimate of the true uh, impact of that particular kind of support. So I'm going to just dwell on this highlighted item in the middle here, this transparent reporting item, because this is somewhere where there has been some really useful and important attention paid, especially to the literature on um, early autism interventions. So the kinds of supports that might be um, deployed uh, 
for children relatively early in their lives. And that's somewhere where we're not necessarily seeing the transparency of reporting that we might like um, to deliver a robust evidence base. So one area where the early autism intervention literature is really not up to scratch is in consideration of risk of harms. So looking across multiple studies, and this is based on a systematic review that was done by uh, Kristen Batima Butel, who I think has spoken to the group, and Michael Sandbank and others. Um, what they found in that systematic review was a widespread failure of studies to even acknowledge the possibility of risk of harms, let alone to attempt to measure those or report those. So in 93% of the 150 or so studies that were included in that review, harms were not even mentioned. There was pretty negligent reporting in terms of um, uh, uh, measures of harms or, or consideration of harms, um, it was partly driven as well by a very narrow definition of harms. So lots of authors, um, to the extent that harms were even considered or, or sort of implicit in the neglect of consideration of harms, was this idea that um, the only thing that would count as a harm would be something quite kind of direct and proactive. So you could take the parallel in a clinical trial of taking a particular medicine and having a negative side effect. You know, if you take a medicine and it gives you headaches, that's an obvious risk of harm. But there are other kinds of harms that might be more applicable to the kind of psychobehavioral interventions that are very common in the early autism intervention literature. Things like harmful displacement, time that you're spending on a particular uh, intervention activity, sometimes many, many hours a week, uh, money that you're spending on that intervention that could otherwise have been invested in other activities. And of course, the fact that we have this really uninformative literature where studies are not measuring harms, they're not reporting harms, they're not considering harms broadly enough, that means that we have an interventional literature that is uninformative. We simply cannot answer the question, are the interventions that are, that are being reported in the autism literature harmful or not? So there's a complete black hole in our knowledge. So yes, as I say, the impact of that is this black hole in our knowledge. More specifically, um, there's a lack of long-term monitoring. So um, a lot of these approaches are being delivered, as I say, early on in people's lives. And the, a lot of the rationale behind that is that um, there's a degree of kind of plasticity in development. Young children are sort of learning machines, they're sponges, they soak up lots of things in their environment. We know that particularly when it comes to things like language development, there are sensitive windows early in life where it's really important to try and lay down some kind of foundations for language, um, if that's a kind of desired outcome. But of course, the, the flip side to that sort of sensitive period and all of that developmental plasticity and potential is that you're also laying down patterns that could potentially last a lifetime. And if those patterns are negative, then the harms could last a lifetime. So, so following up young children um, uh, for years and years after their participation in these intervention studies is really important if we're going to properly capture possible harms. Um, so uh, examples of the kind of harms that we might see would be, um, uh, for example, encouraging autistic children to um, respond to the kind of commands and instructions of others that can lay down behavioural patterns which are going to impact on autonomy and independence later in life in terms of autistic people being decision makers and in control of their own kind of destinies. Um, and of course, that could make them vulnerable to exploitation and abuse as well. So if you're working with someone very, very young and teaching them that their role in life is to listen to the instructions of others and comply with those, that's going to potentially have significant harmful effects. More immediately, I think there's concern, and, and this is something that Michelle Dawson um, and I have written about, but particularly um, this is kind of Michelle's take on things, and I really love it. This idea that, you know, there's a risk that by diverting the developmental trajectory of autistic children, we are causing a loss of engagement with their own autistic interests, with their own adaptive behaviours, their own 
um, self-generated approaches to managing the world and of course their strengths and talents as well. And so that's a really important risk of harm that at the moment is not being measured or captured at all. And of course, more broadly, the fact that we have a body of literature that is utterly disregarding even the possibility of harm being caused to autistic children um, is part of a broader narrative that can feed into the dehumanization of autistic people and that can underlie abusive practices. So it's part of a sort of, it's not, it's not necessarily that there's a direct link from a particular study to a particular abusive practice. It's more that it's part of a culture where autistic rights and autistic humanity is not being recognized adequately. So another element of kind of transparent reporting that is problematic in the early autism intervention literature at the moment is conflicts of interest. So again, drawing on this same study, um, there is a widespread failure to report conflicts of interest. And that's where the authors of a study um, potentially are compromised in terms of um, their ability to uh, objectively reflect on their study and you know where they may be invested in a particular outcome of the study that might um, explicitly or more often implicitly or subconsciously bias the way that they design that study the way they analyze the data or the way they interpret the results so in this meta-analysis they found that um, of 105 studies where the, the authors of the meta-analysis independently found identifiable conflicts of interest only six of those 105 studies had reported those conflicts of interest. 48 of those 105 studies, in fact, didn't just fail to report all the relevant conflicts of interest. They expressly said that there were no conflicts of interest applicable. And again, this is partly based on a narrow definition of what constitutes a conflict of interest, similar to my description of the problem around risk of harms. So, of course, lack of reporting of conflict of interest drives low standards in clinical autism research and makes it extremely hard to get an unbiased understanding of the evidence base because we can't really determine the extent to which um, effective interventions that are reported in the literature are driven by um, a, a kind of biased practice, including, of course, subconscious bias. I'm not accusing people of fraudulent behavior, um, but we're, we're not we're not. Um, managing out the possibility of that implicit bias. Um, and of course, you know, um, heavily hyped programs can end up making major profits um, based on claims about impact for autistic people that may not really be supported um, or wouldn't be supported in a more independent evidence base. Um, and particularly in America, we see this kind of commercial influence over the way that policy is, uh, is constructed, though that's also present in other countries. So I also just wanted to touch on this concept of sort of meaningfulness in the evidence base. So thinking about diversity in participant groups. So we really want to know that if you're um, creating a new way of supporting autistic children, that it's going to be applicable to a range of ethnicities, that it's going to be effective for autistic people across a range of ability profiles with and without intellectual disability that um, autistic children of all genders are going to be included in that process. And we know that in the literature so far, we do not have those things. We have a literature that's heavily based on white male participants um, and with a lot more evidence from children without an intellectual disability than children with. Another aspect of meaningfulness that I just wanted to touch on that will lead into the next section of the talk is the concept of validity and outcome measures. So, um, the, the success or otherwise of a particular intervention approach hinges almost entirely on what we define as a positive outcome. So we need to have, first of all, a construct, an idea that we're measuring that reflects meaningful flourishing. And for me, that means moving away from measures based on um, diagnostic features of autism, right? The, 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 the concept of meaningful flourishing in it for an autistic person is not become less autistic, become more like a neurotypical person, right? There are other ways to capture flourishing that have much more validity in the eyes of the autistic community. 
But we also need to make sure that those measures are not just capturing a relevant construct and have validity for autistic people, but also that they're sensitive to change. So this is another problem with using diagnostic tools like the ADOS, the Autism Diagnostic Observation Schedule, to measure outcome from clinical trials. Those tools were never designed to be sensitive to change, to capture shifts in profile over time. They're designed to be diagnostic. They focus on what are the defining characteristics that separate autistic and non-autistic people so that I can make an accurate diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Utterly different from what are the things that might help this young person flourish and what are the things that we might expect to change over time if we were, if we were aiming to kind of support that flourishing. And of course, we need outcome measures that are resistant to bias. So in the, in the context of a literature that I've just described, where we're not measuring risk of harms, where we're not reporting conflicts of interests, um, we really need measures that are going to be um, as independent and unbiased as possible, as objective as possible. So that means not scored by researchers um, who, who know the, the status of the participants in the study, um, not reported by parents who are invested in, in wanting to see positive outcomes for their, for their children. And there is a real lack of, of those kinds of measures. Okay, so that's my kind of uh, rant about trial methodologies for you. And as I say, there's a lot more to designing a really high quality clinical trial and also to getting to that point of being able to run a clinical trial. But these are some areas where I think the autism intervention literature is really kind of falling down and we need to collectively work to raise our game. And now I wanted to talk a bit about co-production or participatory methods. So starting off with sort of why I think this is an important component of a high quality evidence base. So why does working with autistic people, working with their families, um, their siblings, their carers and so on, why is that something that I think we should be doing that's relevant to a quality evidence base? So I think the first position is that there's a, a powerful moral principle at stake here. Um, I think that uh, autistic people, like many other communities, um, have been marginalized historically, they're underrepresented in our research leadership, in our practitioner leadership. Um, and so that means that they are not part of the agenda that is shaping so much of their lives, that's determining policy and practice in our schools and in our clinics and so on. Um, the other thing is that um, these are communities that where the majority of people are not going to be experts. So, of course, there is an increasing number of autistic people in academia, um, autistic practitioners. There's a wonderful autistic doctors network in the UK now with over 300 members. They're completely fantastic. Um, so, of course, there are autistic people in these professions, but they will always I think by definition be in a minority because autistic people are in a minority more generally in our population and of course most autistic people are not going to become doctors or professors because most people generally don't become doctors or professors right so there's a particular uh, requirement to make sure that when we're working with community representatives we're working not just with our autistic colleagues in the workplace but also with autistic people who are outside of that environment of course, a lack of engagement with priorities has driven some of the kind of historic abuses and vulnerabilities that are experienced by the autistic community. And I've put historic in brackets here because um, uh, sadly, those abuses are still happening today in many parts of the world. Um, sadly, regularly in the UK, we uncover uh, stories of a, of a kind of care home, a, a residential care setting where autistic people are living and supposedly being looked after by professionals and, um, and it is uncovered that, that there are abuses taking place in those settings and that's not historical, that's, that's a modern day fact and, and one that um, is distressingly frequent. I think another reason, a more optimistic and cheerful reason to be engaging with members of the autistic community at the moment is just the demand and the opportunity. There is a huge and growing body of autistic people, as I say, within but also outside academia, who are crying out to play a role in shaping their own destinies or, or the destinies of the generations who come after them in terms of um, uh, identifying what research gets done and how that feeds into policy and practice for the future. 
I also think there are loads of practical advantages to doing participatory working. Um, it's, it's, it's a really great way of working. So if you particularly want to reach so-called hard to reach populations, so we could use that phrase to describe autistic people in general, but especially if you want to work with uh, autistic people of a minority ethnicity or non-speaking autistic people or autistic people with a diagnosis of bipolar disorder or whatever is the kind of uh, particular population that you are interested in, in working with, if you are partnered with representatives from that group, that's going to open a huge number of doors in terms of your recruitment process, but also in terms of the, the authenticity and the quality of the work. And so I also think that working with autistic people can, work, can, can be a very effective in terms of minimizing research risks, meeting your recruitment targets, capturing high quality data, um, you know, participants completing all of the questions in your survey and not giving up halfway through because they can't bear to fill out another AQ for the billionth time this year or whatever it might be. Um, of course, a lot of what we're trying to do research, in research, especially in clinical research, is produce findings that can be translated and implemented in practice, right? We want to see the results of our work being used in hospitals and, and doctor's surgeries and schools and so on. And we all know that there's a big translational gap and it can be very, very difficult to, from the point of sort of publishing a research finding to get that out into the world and being used on the ground. If you're working with the potential users of that research from the very beginning, so that's going to include autistic people, but also perhaps teachers or GPs or parents or speech and language therapists, then that's going to make it much more straightforward to bridge that translational gap because you've had those users in mind from the very first principles of the study. And of course, finally, increasingly uh, funders require this kind of uh, engagement. Often in the UK, it's called PPI, public and patient involvement, um, as part of their expectations when you're seeking grant funding. So if you're going to do participatory research, I think something that's important to flag is that this is a framework that sits alongside various other decisions you might be making about your research. So I come from psychology as an academic discipline that's going to define a lot of what I do. Um, I might be designing a study that's going to do interviews with people or an online survey, or I might be doing a clinical trial or some eye tracking. Um, and maybe I'm planning to have a project blog where we update people uh, every now and again about the progress of the project. It's very easy to think that particularly if you're doing qualitative data collection and you've got lots of public engagement work planned as part of your project, that means you're doing participatory working. But actually, participatory working is a fourth kind of component of your work because none of those things are facilitating representatives of your community of your community to actually have decision making power in the research that you're doing to have control so for example when you're collecting qualitative data in an interview yes you're hearing authentic voices of autistic people but you or i have decided what questions i'm asking right and so I've got all the control and power in that situation. And that's not a fully participatory approach just because it's qualitative. So I think there's there's various kind of kinds of participatory research. Sometimes these are presented as a ladder. But personally, I think it's more interesting to think of different approaches um, being mapped onto the question that you're asking and, and what you're interested in. So um, consultation. Uh, on the left hand side here, this is where the research team, um, I'm presuming a neurotypical research team, of course that would not always be the case, but your, your research team have most of the power and they're just inviting community members in to provide specific advice at particular points in the project, right? So you might ask some people to help you design your consent forms to make them accessible. And that flows through to the kind of opposite extreme on the right, where most of the control and power is in the hands of community representatives. And so it's really kind of the tables have turned. This is a project that's being led by autistic people in the community. And you as a researcher might be brought in as an employee or a consultant to do a specific component of that project. And then there's everything in between uh, different levels of kind of balance and shared power, essentially, uh, between those two extremes. So when you're doing participatory research, you know, 
it's really important to do it in a thoughtful and measured way, just as you would put thought and care into any other part of your research methodology. Um, so it's hard to do well. Um, it takes time and money and um, and very often at the end of the project, you will regret some things that you did and wish you had done them better. So in that sense, it's like all other research. Um, so you're going to want to think about who you want to include. Setting expectations is absolutely essential. Making sure that you are honest and transparent about what you are able to offer as a researcher, what level of control and decision making power you concede to the community representatives that you're working with. Um, and making sure that the, the limitations inherent in the way that you've been funded or the timeline of your research or your career stage, whether you're a PhD student or a, a tenured professor, um, being really, really clear about those things. So it can be tempting to go into this and sort of try and promise the moon on a stick. But actually, of course, that's not going to lead to a trusting relationship for you and your partners. You're going to want to think about specific measures to engage the particular members of the community that you want to work with. So often for autistic people, that will be thinking about the sensory environment that you're working in, the communication methods that you're using. But different measures will apply to different people. If you're working with teachers, you have to understand the working day of teachers, the rhythm of the school term and the holidays, and make sure that your participatory work is cognizant of that and structured around that. You're going to want to think about intersectionality. People are bringing more than just one identity to the table, right? So um, think about uh, the, the opportunities that come from engaging with uh, community representatives who bring different kinds of lived experience to the table, not just their diagnostic status or the fact that they're a parent of an autistic child, perhaps. Throughout the process, you want to think about empowerment. How much power can you give to the community representatives? What is the implicit balance of power in any particular environment? So if you're hosting meetings in a university, for example, that's somewhere where I feel comfortable. That's where I work every day. I know how to navigate the buildings. I'm not intimidated by the oil paintings of old men up on the wall. But for someone coming into that environment who's not there every day, that could be a very disempowering environment. And it might be better to meet in a coffee shop or a community centre or to visit them at home, for example. And throughout that process, you want to be creating a culture of knowledge exchange. So the knowledge is flowing in both directions. I'm offering, I hope, the community partners that I work with insights into the research process, into theory, into how research is translated into policy and practice. And I hope that that is um, interesting knowledge at the very, at the very uh, least, but perhaps also useful knowledge. And of course, I am uh, um, drawing on huge amounts of knowledge from them and gaining insights that are important to my work from their lived experience. So I've got some kind of top tips here. I'm going to run through these very quickly, actually, but um, I'll just pause on each slide so that people uh, watching on YouTube can kind of pause it and have a look if they want to. But there are basically, I think, three principles that I wanted to emphasize. So if you're working in a collaborative relationship with someone who's a community representative, uh, one of the main principles I think you want to achieve is a relationship that's based on kindness and respect. So um, respecting their routine, their preferences, their language choices, um, keeping things accessible and simple, Remember, of course, that a six page information sheet is the opposite of informative for most people. It's like those terms and conditions when your phone updates, right? No one ever reads them. You just click yes. It's not informative. It's not accessible. You're not making an informed choice. You just want to get through it to the thing that you want to do. And I think we make that mistake sometimes in our research materials. Remember to be patient, to be humble above all and valid, value their knowledge um, not in, in relation to yours as sort of better or worse, but, but value it because it's different, because the perspective that they bring is different from the perspective that you bring. And that's the whole point is to have more than one perspective at the table. This is just a list of sources of power imbalance. So as I said, throughout the process, you need to be thinking about empowerment. How much power can you cede to the other party? Because the default position will be that you as the researcher hold most of the power. 
So that's about thinking about um, payment, of course, but also stuff like exposure. So if you're asking someone to share their lived experience, to tell you about their experience of anxiety or their stress, um, to tell you about their their suicidal thoughts, to tell you about the struggles they've had as a parent uh, raising a child who who uh, isn't speaking. What are you giving them in return? You're not exposed at all. You're sitting there sort of aloof and, you know, smartly dressed with your kind of clipboard. Oh, yes, how fascinating, right? This is one of the ways in which the power imbalance is really, really present. I think it's really important to be prepared to share something of yourself if you're asking people to share something of themselves. Um, okay, and then the third principle I think here is kind of trust and transparency. So I've mentioned this a bit already. Honesty about what you're able to achieve together and not over promising is absolutely essential. Um, you want to think about as well um, committing to action. So make sure that if you're inviting someone into the research space um, and asking them to help shape and influence what you're doing, you're actually going to be able to respond to that, uh, that input and make adjustments based on it, right? So it can't be a tick box exercise where you say, I've made a plan and I would like uh, some autistic folk or some parents of autistic children or some teachers to come and tell me that my plan is great, right? <laughs> That's no good. You have to be really wide open to the possibility that they'll come in and tell you your plan is terrible and you have to have a really clear understanding of what you are able or not able to change and be honest about that. Okay, so here we go. So that's the co-production section. So um, harking back to the kind of starting place for this talk, um, as I said, a, a high quality evidence base for autistic people has to be based on robust evidence that's about quality trial designs and it's about transparent reporting, which is somewhere where we're falling down, particularly in the autism literature. But for me, it's also about working with community representatives and that's all about hitting that meaningfulness target, right? Remember I talked about um, objectives that are aligned with community priorities, a delivery system that's feasible to implement uh, and an approach that's accessible to a range of people and inclusive. So um, I now wanted to give you a few examples of what this looks like in practice before going on to talk about how this fits in with neurodiversity, which is a really interesting new sort of theoretical paradigm for underpinning this kind of research. So I'm just going to give you, I think, five examples, one from each of those participatory methods that I had up on the screen earlier. So this is a consultation project that we did called the Family in Residence. And so this was a project where we invited people in to give specific advice on specific things that, you know, we were holding quite a lot of the power. We were deciding when they came in and what, what we sort of showed them and what we got their advice on. Um, and specifically, we were working with one family um, with uh, twin sons uh, here smiling in the front row with glasses on with Fragile X syndrome and their parents. And we wanted to consult with them on clinical trial design and the materials we were using in our clinical trials. So what we ended up with after working with this family for a year was, first of all, a really well educated, well informed and confident family who could um, act as stakeholders for advisory boards in future clinical trials. We had pathways to more effective clinical trial recruitment through the guidance they'd given us on how we recruit and the materials and language we use. And we had a raft of meaningful outcome measures that could be used in clinical trials that were aligned in it with family priorities. Let me just have a sip of water before I carry on just a moment. So this is a partnership model. Um, this started off as me setting up a mentoring relationship with an autistic person here in Scotland um, uh, who was advising me on uh, projects where I didn't have funding for kind of uh, independent participatory work. So small projects conducted by students or grants that I was writing that maybe didn't get funded, but I wanted to make sure I had some autistic input even at the grant writing stage. And we worked closely together over a number of years and that was a chance to build a really close working relationship and, and to achieve a, a degree of equality in terms of power sharing. 
And what that generated was a new autistic parenting project, which is being led by my former mentor who applied for and won funding to do this really innovative project looking at the experiences of autistic parents and specifically autistic play. How do autistic parents play with their autistic children? How might that be different from our kind of neurotypical based models of play? And how might that be important for our kind of clinical and social care services? And so um, KB Brook, who is the, the person I'm talking about, is now doing a master's by research with a project that's focused on autistic parenting. Um, and that came out of this uh, long term relationship and is very much a partnership model. In this collaboration approach, so this is about bringing people together. Um, so I should maybe say pa partnership for me is all about two people working together or two groups working together, but with quite clearly defined roles, right? So in that mentoring relationship, KB was my mentor, I was the mentee, and now as they're studying for their MRes, they're the student and I'm the supervisor. In this collaboration model, we were bringing together different partners, but very much working as a collective. So we didn't have separate kind of roles within the project. Everyone was in the room and had the same kind of role. And this was a piece of work focused on uh, what is good quality care for older autistic adults. So thinking about autistic adults who maybe have lived independently for most of their lives, and as they get older might be moving into residential care, but also thinking about autistic people who have lived in residential care for most of their lives and are now aging in that setting and potentially moving into a different setting as their, their needs change as they become older. So we co-created a grant proposal with a couple of older autistic adults as co-applicants and they were paid at consultancy rates for the duration of the project, important part of power sharing. We recruited a multidisciplinary expert panel that included uh, autistic people, siblings of autistic people, children of autistic people, practitioners from psychiatry and social care, and we generated um, a new measure for interviewing autistic people about their experiences in, uh, in residential care um, and some practitioner guidance, which is summarised here on the left for social care providers. And that was disseminated direct to care homes and also to the oversight body for social care here in Scotland, which is the Care Inspectorate. This is, this is, a, <clears throat> this is a citizen science project. Um, so this is now tipping the balance more towards power being in the hands of the community. This is a project that was generated by a group here in Edinburgh called AMAZE, the Autistic Mutual Aid Society Edinburgh. They're brilliant. They did a survey on mental health um, and they got their data back. And I think it was when they were wrangling their data, they thought, gosh, you know, this is a lot of data and there's a lot to report. And it was a bit difficult to refine it down. So we came in as partners on that project to help um, with the analysis, with the design of the report, to produce some nice infographics for kind of sharing the results and to help signal boost that work. Because once you've got the University of Edinburgh kind of branding behind you, you can maybe reach a slightly different audience. And that was incredibly successful in terms of the impact of that piece of work. But it's also a piece of work that we would never have been able to do if it had been led by us because the insights they got and the participants who took part in that study took part because it was being led by a maze right we would we would not have captured that sample if we had decided to do that study and we wouldn't have asked the right questions either Finally, this is a kind of leadership model. So this is a project that's very much led by members of the autistic community, um, uh, where I am playing a kind of um, consultancy role for a very specific component of the project. So monotropism is an autistic led theory of autism that has had relatively little attention in the mainstream research le literature, despite being very kind of resonant for lots of autistic people. So there's a group who are interested in monotropism who have been um, crowdsourcing items for measuring for a monotropism measure, developing the concept behind a kind of project around that. Um, and of course, in due course, will be heavily involved in disseminating. And I've been brought into that project to help them turn their kind of list of possible items that might capture monotropism and turn that into a self-report measure such that it could be standardised and used in research in the future. Okay, 
So hopefully that's given you some examples of how co-production can be used and the types of research that we can do through those co-production models and how that helps us raise the quality of the evidence base. So let me now just say a bit about neurodiversity and how that fits into this approach. So neurodiversity at bottom is just a very simple scientific fact. All human beings vary in the way that our brains work, right? So the human race is neurodiverse. We take in information in different ways, we process it in different ways, and that leads to differences that are more visible in terms of how we behave. And as I say, this is a property of the entire human race. Everyone is slightly different from the next person. But neurodiversity also helps to explain the existence of the diagnostic categories that we currently use to sort of divide up the human race into different types or, or neurotypes. So if we weren't, if we didn't have neurodiversity within the human race, we wouldn't have categories like autism and ADHD and so on, because our brains would all work in the same way. Okay, so common misunderstandings. I'm not going to do the expanded version of this because I'm keeping an eye on time. I want to make sure that we've got plenty of time for questions. Um, but I am just going to run quickly through some common misunderstandings around the neurodiversity paradigm. So one is that the word neurodiversity is a simple synonym for neurodevelopmental disorders or, or a more educational term. So in Scotland, we would say additional support needs, for example. Um, and so that suggests that if we're applying the concept of neurodiversity, we can essentially just cut and paste in the word neurodiversity where previously we would have said neurodevelopmental disorder or something. But that's really failing to fulfill the power of the idea of neurodiversity. Actually, neurodiversity, while it is a simple scientific fact, it requires a rethink of how and why things are done. If this diversity in the human population is here, it's inevitable, it's part of the human race, it's meant to be here, then we need to shift our perspective on what's the right response to someone who is neurodivergent. Another common misunderstanding is that neurodiversity requires us to focus on the strengths and talents of individuals. So yes, strengths and talents are great, it is lovely when people identify their strengths and talents and are encouraged to cultivate those and are respected and rewarded for the things that they're good at. But neurodiversity isn't as simple as a strengths-based approach. Instead, neurodiversity reminds us that it's the diversity between people that is in itself a strength, right? So you can think about this in a kind of commercial sector, corporate sort of way. If you have a team of people working on developing a new project, product or, or solving some particular problem, if they bring different perspectives to that work environment, they are going to solve that problem more effectively or they're going to come up with more creative ideas for that product, right? But we can also think about it in a slightly less sort of capitalist way, um, you know, Neurodiversity in the human race drives a lot of human innovation and creativity and problem solving and also a huge amount of empathy. Because we're different from each other, we have to work hard to understand each other. We have to work hard to create spaces where we can all thrive and where we're all welcome. And that's part of really the evolution of the whole human race, if that doesn't sound too grandiose. And so in that sense, neurodiversity is in and of itself a strength. Finally, I think lots of people think that the neurodiversity paradigm rejects the idea of disability and denies the very real support needs that many people have. Crucially, I think neurodiversity doesn't deny the concept of disability. Of course, not all neurodivergent people would also identify as disabled. Not all disabled people would identify as neurodivergent. Um, but there's nothing fundamental that means that adopting a neurodiversity perspective doesn't mean you can also um, uh, define yourself as disabled or talk about things in terms of disability. The big difference is not that you're denying needs, it's that you're accepting them without judgment without saying it's bad that you have that need. That need is a problem and it needs to be got rid of. We should try to erase that need or that difference, right? It's all about acceptance of need and offering support without judgment and without requiring normalization. Okay, this is the longer version of it that I'm gonna skip through because I've been talking too much. 
So how does neurodiversity fit together with the participatory methods that I was talking about earlier, right? So hopefully I have convinced at least some of you that participatory working is part of generating a high quality evidence base. But I also think participatory working naturally aligns with the neurodiversity paradigm. So as I've said, neurodiversity is naturally occurring, right? That means that no one is the right way to be or the correct way to be, though there is a more common neurotype that we can call neurotypical. And that means that we should be accepting the differences between people and not seeking to eradicate or minimize these. Secondly, neurodiversity aligns with other equality and diversity dimensions. So just as I, as a white woman, cannot understand the lived experience of a person of color, uh, I, as a neurotypical person, cannot fully understand the lived experience of someone from a different neurotype, someone who's autistic, for example. It also means that, or it reminds us, this alignment of neurodiversity with other equality and diversity dimensions reminds us that the experiences of neurodivergent people are not entirely driven by their own internal neurotype, their own internal information processing style, for example. They're also heavily determined by the reactions of other people by things like stigma, prejudice, discrimination, ignorance and assumptions, right? So we can't understand the experience of neurodivergent people if we're only focused on the individual. We need to understand the individual in the context of their environment, where a big part of that environment is other people. And finally, as I said, neurodiversity itself is a strength, right? Neurodiversity itself is valued. It brings something positive to our, com to our community. And so based on that, we can also uh, uh, set as a fundamental tenet that everyone has a role to play in a community, regardless of their neurotype and regardless of their profile of needs. So participatory research for me, working with autistic people or um, other members of relevant communities outside academia, is a way to show my acceptance of that way of being and my understanding of the, of the validity of that neurotype. Participatory research is a way to capture that experience that is such an important part of what it means to be neurodivergent, what it means to be autistic, for example. And participatory research, bringing people together who have different perspectives, different lived experience, is a way to bring the benefit of that diversity into the research process. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples of what I think neurodiversity informed research can look like briefly before I wrap up. I hope this is okay, Jen. I'm going a little bit over what I said, but. Yes, of course. Okay, thank you. Um, fine, so this is the Leans project. I'm so proud of this project. I'm very excited about it. What we're doing in this project is trying to teach children in primary school what neurodiversity is. So. The idea behind this is to try and address some of the educational inequalities that are experienced by neurodivergent kids in school. We know that they're more likely to be excluded from school. We know that they participate less in class. We know that they're more likely to be bullied and victimized by other children at the school. We know that there are negative mental health consequences of all of these things. And we need to address that stuff. And we think that one way of addressing it is to shift the attitudes and actions of all the other kids in the class, help them understand what it means to be neurodivergent and the role that they play in shaping the experience of their neurodivergent peers. So what we did was co-design a resource pack to introduce the idea of neurodiversity in mainstream primary, primary schools. The pack is delivered by a teacher to the whole class. It was co-developed by a neurodiverse team of researchers and experienced educators. And the goal was to inform pupils and teachers about the concept of neurodiversity and increase the positive and inclusive actions and attitudes of people in that class. So um, actually this latest news has moved on even a little bit. We've just finished the evaluation in four schools across Scotland. We have conducted some interviews with neurodivergent pupils, though we haven't analyzed them yet and we're looking for funding to extend the work. But I can tell you uh, that the approach worked. So we're very excited about that. I won't say any more because uh, it's not my data to share. I should mention that this is a project that's being led by my colleague, Alyssa Alcorn, who is superb, and you should watch out for her for more updates on Leans. 
is another example, the Neurodiversity Alliance. So this is being led by Catherine Crompton, another superb colleague of mine. Um, so this is a, a more of a peer support model, historically peer support for neurodivergent young people has focused on kind of buddy schemes where, say, an autistic young person might be paired with a neurotypical young person who's supposed to kind of show them the ropes, right? Um, and often there's an implicit kind of normalization agenda built into that. Instead, what we're looking to do in this Neurodiversity Alliance project is bring neurodivergent pupils together to facilitate a more positive outlook on that identity, a sense of belonging at school, and also to foster self-advocacy skills. And this is based on some qualitative uh, uh, foundational work that we did with neurodivergent people. So the new model is going to be trialled in three schools and co-designed, and it's partly inspired by existing provision for LGBTQ plus youth. So um, models of uh, peer support networks in schools for queer young people to come together and share experiences. We hope that this approach will have a positive impact on young people's educational engagement, their sense of inclusion and their well-being. Okay, so just returning to where I started. Um, good quality support for autistic people rests on a high quality evidence base. At the moment, I think in autism research, we are not doing that as well as we might. And in particular, I focused on transparency of reporting as somewhere where we could really make some major improvements. I also think a good quality evidence base needs to be meaningful and useful to the community. And I've talked at length about how I think participatory methods can contribute to that. And the last part of it is a commitment to continuous improvement. And the adoption of a neurodiversity paradigm, I think, is a nice example of that, of the constantly evolving discourse and understanding of what it means to be autistic, of what it means to be neurodivergent, and how that should continue to shape the approaches that we develop. And I've given you a couple of examples of, of brand new approaches that are based on that, that foundation. I also just wanted to say that, you know, in terms of continuous improvement, obviously continuous improvement also means continuous engagement, right? Engaging with people all the time, iteratively, over and over again in cycles and adopting those kind of core principles, uh, kindness and respect, sharing power and trust and transparency. So this is something that we try to do um, as well as we can at the South and Mind and Research Centre, these are just some examples of ways that we try to make sure that we have a kind of open back and forth dialogue. So we, we developed a podcast called Psychological, we published policy briefings summarising our research, um, we, uh, we have developed an app to support parents through the diagnostic process. So we're trying all the time to make sure that our work is filtering out into the community and that that's done in an open, a conversational way and we're hearing back from people um, whether they think what we've been doing is useful and how we can do better in the future. Right, this is my last slide. I will now draw to a close, but just to kind of finish off, I think the ideal result uh, at the end of a process of really high quality evidence gathering around uh, support for autistic people is that you have a group of people who feel empowered and happy about the research that they've been a part of that you've developed a, a piece of research, a discovery or an approach that people want and can use, and that you have a group of community collaborators who have been increased in terms of their skills and their, um, uh, the amount that, that they are informed as a result of partnering with you. But that doesn't mean that you haven't also based what you're doing on a kind of solid and robust theoretical model, high quality methods, that you're not producing high quality evidence-based supports and research. It's not an either or choice that you can either do great research or engage with the autistic community. The, the two things are, are absolutely enmeshed. That is where I will finish. I have got some links up here for people who want to find out more, um, uh, including to the conference that I mentioned right at the beginning and our research website and my new blog that I haven't put many blog posts on yet, but there'll be some on there soon. And I will stop sharing at that point and hope that we can have some discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sue. So do we still want to do a brief pause or? Uh, yeah, I think a little break would be really nice if okay. that's okay. 
Yes. So we are going to just take a very quick five minute break. Um, please think of your questions while we're on a break, grab a snack or whatever makes you happy. And we will be right back with, with more with Dr. Sue Fletcher, Fletcher Watson. <laughs>
Okay, we're back. Thank you so much for sticking around if you did. Um, so I'm gonna get to some of the chat questions first and then I have a few questions of my own. Um, okay, so first from Autism ADHD Journey Bucks, uh, regarding evidence-based provision in respect of legal cases, it's not always in the child's best interests. How come we see parents being legally supported in fighting for ABA support in the UK, they said? Um, well, that is a, that's, uh, so the UK, in the UK specifically, um, so the UK setting is, um, is particular in terms of health and social care and indeed education provision, because everything is really provided by the state. I mean, obviously there are private healthcare companies, but the vast majority of people in the UK will go for the, um, uh, the, the public sector provision, right? Nationalized healthcare and education and so on. And they have very strict um, uh, uh, definitions of what constitutes evidence-based support that they will then deliver within their model. Um, and the, the fact is that, that ABA has not met those criteria and is therefore not available for um, uh, public provision. And personally, I, I support that. That might not be what this questioner would like to hear because I have serious doubts about um, uh, the ABA, ABA evidence base. It is an evidence base that is rife with many of the problems that I described at the beginning of my talk in terms of failure to capture risk of harms, uh, failure to declare conflicts of interest. Um, so I personally feel that that's an appropriate approach to be delivered in the UK in terms of our public sector services. Of course, there are independent providers. Um, and if that's something that you feel is important to you and your family, then, then that's the route that's available in the UK. Okay, thank you for that. So kind of this is a good follow up then because um, we have another question from Moish Tov. Um, and so um, what he was writing is that the evidence based model in autism, um, I'm going to sort of paraphrase this, but he said it's a main cause that families have been in limbo and it's harmed autistic people as you know, you were exploring quite uh, deeply in the beginning of this webinar. And, um, you know, he kind of was comparing it to like medical research, um, which targets, you know, like biological underpinnings. Um, and then, so I have a side note about that after this, but so one of the examples he gave is that ABA has, you know, been sold, especially here in America, that it's evidence-based and proven um, another example he said is that non-speakers have been considered to have intellectual disability, which we know that a lot most tools that are used are not really taking into account the motor and language differences and processing differences. Um, and so what, um, what he says is that the outcome is that we have all of this stigma to fight. And so we're, we're kind of on, in this uphill battle of trying to get good supports for people. And then the term evidence-based has almost been weaponized in a way to kind of shut down any sort of questioning or dissent or you know anything of the sort. Um, so one of the, he says that uh, he, had, he had created this company um, for his two non-speaking sons and, and other non-speaking autistic people. Um, and he said that, uh, like one of one of the solutions that they came up with was that instead of assuming no competence, they assume competence, and um, he calls it disruptive innovation. So I just wanted to thank him for that and see. Um, do you feel like do different countries really have a different standard of what evidence based is considered, and like who's kind of like who's calling the shots on what is considered evidence based when it comes to autism? So um, it's it's a really interesting question, and and I love the the broader comment as well. Um, and I agree with much of that analysis. I think that um, I think there's actually fairly consistent notion of what constitutes evidence based in clinical research. Um, uh, the issues come 
from a few things. So one is um, the fact that, you know, our models for capturing an evidence base almost entirely come out of drug trials, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, you know, a, a trial for um, a new stroke medication, for example. And there you have a very clear objective. You have a patient who was previously healthy, has now become sick. You would like them to be healthy again. Everyone agrees on that objective. No one wants to be sick. Um, no one wants to have, you know, cancer or whatever. And so there's a sort of straightforwardness about the objective, about how you measure that objective. Um, there's a straightforwardness about how you define who is in that clinical trial, you know, in terms of, you know, if you're doing a, a trial of a new blood pressure medication, you come in the trial if your blood pressure is too high, right? None mm -hmm. of those things apply to autism research. And of course, there's the additional complication of the fact that many of the most appropriate ways that we might think about supporting autistic people are about, you know, behavior between individuals, communication support, environmental adjustments, and so on. It's not a pill. And so that means you can't have a placebo condition, right? You can't have a sugar pill that's given to the other half. So, so I think the standard of evidence is the same, but the difficulty comes that you know, how many modifications or what types of modifications to your standard you are able or prepared to make to make it fit for purpose for the kinds of approaches that are relevant to autistic people, right? And the kinds of inclusion criteria that you might apply and so on. And that's where manipulations can creep in because as soon as you've said, which I think most people would agree with, you can't wholesale drop in the model that's used for cancer treatments, for example, you can't just take that model and be like, boom, we'll do that for autism as right. well. So as soon as everyone's agreed that, then you've got this kind of, ooh, so I can maybe shift it in this direction that helps me a little bit prove that my thing is most effective. And that's where things like conflict of interest is so important because with the best will in the world, if you have spent years designing something, you would like it to work, you know? Yeah. Um, I think another factor, another factor is that, um, which I think is sort of related to this, maybe doesn't directly ask your, answer your question, but I'll say it anyway, is um, it, it's very sad to me that we have, we, we have a very poor quality evidence base when it comes to kind of comprehensive support approaches for autistic people. Um, but um, that means for me that there's all the more reason with the limited resources that we have and the pressing need for a, a very large number of autistic people to be better supported than they currently are. It's, it's absolutely essential that we focus our resources on the approaches that are most likely to work. And, and by that, I mean approaches that are meaningful to people and that are addressing targets that they care about. Um, so I think one of the issues is that we have wasted time with an agenda that's focused on trying to make autistic people less autistic. Mm -hmm. and there's problems with that evidence base, but also fixing the quality of the evidence base is kind of by the by. We shouldn't have we should have never gone down that road in the first place. It's a completely different road we should be going down. Um, but having marched off down that road people on that road have more evidence than the people who are marching off down a different road because they got started faster, you know, right. 30, 40 years ago. So right. we're playing catch up with our approaches, which is one of the reasons I think acknowledging participatory approaches as a key marker of what constitutes quality evidence is very important because it helps us combat that idea that, oh, well, I've got more RCTs than you, so my approach is better than yours, right? Because you can have yes. all the other in the world, but if you're addressing the wrong thing, I couldn't care less. Um, <laughs> so that those are some of my thoughts. Yeah, no, completely. And part of the part of the issue is not only were was a lot of the research able to be done um, for a longer period of time, but it can also be done more quickly in general because it does not include all of those other quality indicators, like you said. And and so, but this is another way that families especially have been confused and kind of misled, if you will, because the evidence, 
essentially has been misrepresented to a large extent in the Absolutely. And and I suppose something else I would say is that, you know, having advocated for a strong evidence base throughout this talk, which is something I feel passionately about, I think there's also not enough attention paid to the things that families can do, especially thinking about kind of young children, uh, relatively recently diagnosed, perhaps, the things that families can do immediately to support the young person, um, their child. So, you know, for example, things like work out what he likes doing best and try and do a bit of that every day or every week right yeah uh, work out what are his or her what are her sensory needs and try and create a space in your house that is a sensory safe space for that person you know you can get a little pop-up tent put some furry blankets in it nice pair of noise cancelling headphones or a you know wishy white noise machine or something. I mean, I realize that not everyone has the resources to pay for these things, but there are there are immediate things that can be done that will yield an immediate benefit for very many young people. And we're not talking about those things enough. And in fact, of course, a lot of the narrative is completely in the opposite direction to what I've just described. You know, if your child enjoys lining up toys, a lot of what what uh, intervention providers will say is that's bad he shouldn't yeah. be doing that stop that right but if that's a source of joy and uh and replenishment for someone of course they should do that of course they should do that and that should be actively facilitated um there there may need to be some structure around it such that there are also other things in that person's life such that they also go swimming from time to time and have a meal with the family. You know, I, I do understand that that these things can sort of um, escalate out of control. And, and we have done some work on that uh, here in the UK. But but I think this kind of default approach that that's something that a, a neurotypical kid would not be doing. And therefore, by definition, it's wrong and needs to be. Right. Eradicated. There's yeah. there's no space for that. Yeah, so so that goes back to the broader problem of the deficit model that we've had. Um, and I just want to say, Moish had another comment that's that families want solutions. Trust us, we can evaluate good science and bad science. And I do think that many of us can. But again, the problem comes in where you have people in positions of authority who are saying otherwise that you know this is this deficit needs to be addressed. There's this evidence that shows that this works and this is what the kid needs. And then there's also the problem of not necessarily having lack of choice. And this is something that we've talked about. And I think this is to this greater point here is that, so the problem with a low quality evidence base is not only the problem of the evidence itself, but it's also the effects of what then happens to what resources and supports are available to the families. And so, we've had decades now of, of science that has not lived up to the standards that we should expect in the world of autism. And we're now stuck with a system that, that really is not working for most people. And another, another thing I'd love for you to address here is that what seems to happen also a lot of the time is that because of the research standards, which then lead to the practices, and because of the lacking, the lack of the tracking of harms, we do have harms. And then what happens is that's blamed on autism. And then more money gets spent toward targeting the harms when in fact, if, if we didn't allow those to happen in the first place, we wouldn't be having to spend the money working on the harms. So what would you like to uh, say about that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I completely agree. So, so I think you know, I think there's a couple of ways that this is manifest. So one is that any kind of support agenda that is focused on, you know, um, uh, encouraging kids onto a kind of neurotypical developmental trajectory, be less autistic, be more neurotypical, um, is, is essentially driving stigma because it's saying that being autistic is an unfortunate and undesirable thing and that's best avoided, right? So, so that drives, you know, parental fear around the time of diagnosis and, um, and distress and all the difficulty of coming to terms with that. Um, and, 
it, it drives, you know, kind of judgment from neighbours and friends and in the community and, and lack of acceptance and so on, because, you know, the entire narrative is based on the idea that being autistic is a is an unfortunate thing. What a tragedy for your family, you know, which is completely unacceptable to me. Um, I, before you go further, can you just address, too, because one of the counter arguments that people hear is we're not trying to make people less autistic. We just want to teach skills. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, how am I going to address that? OK, so so I think there's a couple of things. One is. Um, uh, so what are the skills that are being taught and, and for whose benefit are these skills, right? So if one of your skills is eye contact, for example, that is not for the benefit of the autistic child who has um, grown up thinking mm, this eye contact business isn't really for me, right? Fine. That eye contact skill is purely for the benefit of the other people in that autistic person's life who, who can't wrap their heads around the idea that someone might be... Um, uh, have a loving relationship with you and interested in you and paying attention to you if they're not looking at your eyes. So I think that's um, that's one kind of uh, problem is, is that what are the skills being taught? I think the other problem is what is the mechanism by which they're being taught, right? So this kind of, um, you know, uh, uh, not so much breaking down skills into component parts, but the sort of, um, you know, uh, have a smarty reward kind of approach to things right which is all about behavioral compliance yeah. um and all about you know do what i tell you to do so even if the thing that you're being asked to do seems to be quite a sensible thing you know skills around dressing yourself or going to the toilet independently these are things that you know um you know every parent would want for their child and i completely sympathize with that um but if you're going to teach that skill by instilling a pattern that says you should comply at all times with the adults around you and you'll be rewarded if you do so and punished if you fail to do so that yeah. is a toxic relationship that regardless of whether those skills are learned is going to have downstream negative effects for that young person um yeah. going back is that yes yeah good thank you briefly to the original question i just wanted to say something about anxiety so so even apart from that sort of quite extreme example that i've just described i think a lot of what we're doing around autistic children in their youth is teaching them that their instincts are wrong um, and that their sort of subjective experience is incorrect in some way. And I think that drives a lot of the anxiety experienced by autistic people and, uh, and builds up a huge um, unmet need that often surfaces later in childhood and in adolescence and adulthood. Um, and certainly in the UK, we have a problem where autistic people will come to mental health services seeking support for things like anxiety and be told, well, of course you're anxious, um, you're autistic, so there's nothing we can do about that, right? Which is really <laughs> distressing. Um, yeah. So I think we do need to think about the um the 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 sort of um a, a more sort of low arousal approach a low stress approach a, an approach that's based on self-esteem and self-knowledge and um fostering a kind of positive self-regard and a and an understanding of, of kind of what makes you tick and, and a sense of being allowed to to be yourself um and and that's that's going to have I hope, positive downstream effects in terms of the mental health of autistic people. Yeah. And really just going back to the um, the lack of, of solutions that we have right now, um, this is really a problem of morality, I think, and a problem of human rights. Like we've talked about this a lot, how this is this really, we're kind of at a crisis point because we now have generations of autistic adults who have not been served and accommodated properly. Um, and, you know, it's like, 
people talk about, like, I don't know about in the UK, but they talk about this cliff that people fall off of when they reach adulthood because there's no services. For some reason, and I, you know, perhaps it's the narrative that these behavioral interventions were going to fix. I mean, we have people here who claim that people behaviorally recover if they get a certain intensity of intervention. Um, that's harmful for a number of reasons, but it's also just flatly not true. And so we now have adults who do not have pretty much any support available. And, you know, I, like, I'm just wondering, like, for, for all of us, like, how, what do you suggest in terms of people working together to kind of transform this? Clearly, the participatory research is extremely important. Um, but do you have any other ideas? Well, I suppose it's not just about participatory research, but also participatory practice. So um, thinking about working with um, uh, the kind of the real experts, the experts by experience in your area to develop practice in a more immediate way. So, for example, in a school, um, I would be if I was, you know, in charge of the world in schools, I would be looking to um, identify and hire more autistic teachers. I would be looking at what those teachers can bring to the classroom, their reflections on their own school experience and how they can foster an inclusive classroom by virtue of an insight that I as a neurotypical person would not have. Mm -hmm. um, I would be looking at um, uh, if I was a parent, well, I am a parent of an autistic child actually, but um, uh, as a parent, I would be looking to engage with autistic adults on social media, on Twitter. I would be looking to draw on the expertise that they have, the insights that they have, especially if if my child had uh, a learning disability or if my child was um, non-speaking and, you know, I had to do a lot of kind of interpretation of mm -hmm. their behavior and a lot of kind of inference about what might be going on under the surface, I would be wanting um, autistic adults insights to help me sort of do, do that translation job, you know, to, to, to work out what might be going on and what might be a useful response from me or from other people around them. Um, uh, similarly, I would want to be reading the writings of autistic adults. I'd want to be forming connections with other parents and sharing resources and ideas based on you know, the, the, the subtle things, the little things that people have worked. Oh, I got this great blackout blind and now he's sleeping in much longer. Or, you know, yeah. we've got this kind of special kind of light based timer and it's really fantastic. You know, those tips shared between parents are often much more useful than anything. <laughs> so, so, it you know, so all of that is really participatory methodology, you know, within yeah. the within services you don't necessarily need to wait or at least you can't wait for someone to churn out an rct let alone multiple rcts right. um, and so i think there has to be that um that co-production approach being used on a sort of you know cyclical basis in the services and in the community where people are yeah absolutely um Maybe one last thing we could talk about is, um, and I want to say that Moish said thank you so much. It's so refreshing to hear your perspective. Um, there's a lot. I feel like there. There's this quote. Let me let me just read it quickly. I have it here before, but it talks about, um, like when something affects someone more than it affects you, remember that it will take a much greater emotional toll on them than you. Um, it may feel like an academic exercise for people who aren't personally impacted, but it's actually very emotionally taxing, you know, for those. Um, and, and, and so, and I think even when it comes to like thinking about the autistic community and how many people don't necessarily value their perspectives or experiences and they almost 
some some don't even consider it as important um or if it conflicts with you know the the research or the practice that they're doing they'll just find ways to kind of you know push it aside and not take it seriously so as a researcher what would what would you say to other researchers and practitioners um about why they should listen to the perspectives of the people who this is impacting, even when there may be challenges in doing so? Um, I mean, I, 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 think, I think there's a kind of terrible irony at the heart of what you've just described, which is that, you know, largely neurotypical researchers, of course, not all, but largely neurotypical researchers for generations, yeah, well, for decades, have been um, labeling autistic people, for example, as lacking empathy, um, while showing a devastating lack of empathy themselves for autistic lived experience. And as you say, for the kind of emotional burden and the potential trauma that um, that can arise from being an autistic person trying to get by in the world today. Mm -hmm. um, I think similarly, you know, we label autistic people as being rigid and inflexible, and yet we refuse to adapt what we're doing, our processes and our methods as researchers or our practices in a classroom or, or in a clinic setting. Um, we, we talk about autistic people as having communication impairments and utterly fail to recognize that communication happens between people. It's not something that one person does on their own. And so we are equally responsible for any failure to effectively communicate and more so often because we are, you know, if we're adults and they are children, whose responsibility is it to make that communication work? It is the yeah. adult's responsibility. Um, so I think I think that um, I just think that researchers need to take a long, hard look at themselves in the mirror and say, am I really helping people? What did I get into this job to do? You know, and um, uh, and as I say that, I think it's really important to be explicit that I am not. I am not some sort of paragon of virtue when it comes to this. I, <laughs> constantly failing in, in the most basic way to, to live up to some of the principles I've described in, in the talk today. You know, I, I, the autistic people who work with me will know that I regularly, um, you know, fail to share power as effectively as I can. I, I send things out and I think, oh, it's a rush. I really need to look at it today. And, you know, all of these things, I mean, absolute kind of, you know, sort of participatory research 101 kind of basic, basic <laughs> errors um but like everything in research like everything in science we just commit to doing better and to reflecting on uh the limitations of our work and learning from those limitations and and producing something higher quality next time and um and it, it it's no different you know um so that's my that's what allows me to sort of fall asleep at night despite my many failings um and i think i think i think it requires a bit of a sort of pushback against you know the the sort of academic ego that um that is such a healthy part of being an academic <laughs> uh to to show a little humility and a little a little um uh, self-reflection as, as researchers. Yeah. Well, thank you. That was, um, illuminating. And, um, I know it's like as a family member and just as someone who's in this field, there is so much to wade through and there's, there are so many, um, there are so many things that we can do better with. And I think the main point is that so long as we continue trying and being open to listening, um, which is exactly what you said, then you know we can rest our heads on the pillows and 
just keep doing our best to improve and and do better. So um, we appreciate you so much. Thank you for joining us today. And um, it was an absolute pleasure. We learned so much from you. Um, this recording will be available for anyone who wants to rewatch or share, please share. Um, and um, Joe is going to post, I don't know if he has already, but we're going to post the um, certificate of attendance link if anyone is interested. Um, and um, I just want to say again, Stu, thank you so very much. We appreciate you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm nervous about all my ranting being available for posterity. <laughs> <laughs> I really enjoyed coming and talking to you, Jen. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Joe, we'll send us off. Have a great day, everyone. We'll be back next week.